Hello lovely viewers, you are most welcome to our channel Poetry Online. In this video, we shall be discussing the detailed analysis of The Invincible Man by Ralph Ellison. Kindly subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to get updates on all our new videos. Once again, let us assure you of a very interesting discussion. Get ready for this lesson. The Invincible Man is a novel written by Ralph Ellison. The novel is set in 20th century America, first in the American South and later in Harlem. The South represents the bastion of black oppression, where the most aggressive laws of white dominance prevail. There, blacks are considered subhuman and suffer much discrimination. The Basel Royal incident in the novel symbolizes the kind of racial oppression blacks suffer in the hands of whites, especially in the American South. After some time, the narrator leaves the South and moves to Harlem, the dream destination of most Southerners. At the time the novel was written, migration from the South to the North was considered a sign of advancement and freedom for blacks. The narrator likewise travels with the hope of working for a year and returning to college, but this is not to be. In Harlem, his dreams are shattered and the illusions about life in the North, symbolized by New York, are destroyed. He goes through a rebirth and comes to see the world as it is. He now sees the world as a place where injustice prevail and blacks are oppressed because of the color of their skin. The novel, Invincible Man, which was published in 1952, is set in the United States of America. It is a novel that depicts very vividly the racial stratification of the American society, which has led to the marginalization of African Americans for more than 300 years. The first group of African Americans who came to the United States were brought there as slaves. However, in spite of the Emancipation Law made in the 13th Amendment to the American Constitution, which set all African Americans slave free from physical bondage, new laws were set in place to ensure that this category of people remain indentured slaves and laborers for life. Laws like the Jim Crow laws and sets like the Ku Klux Klan an American white supremacist hate organization, which was founded in 1866, were put in place to ensure that African Americans did not have the same rights as whites had. They attended segregated schools, patronized segregated stores, took segregated buses, lived in segregated neighborhoods, and rented segregated apartments. All these facilities were staff standard and mainly unaffordable to most blacks. Many African Americans had to contend with racism daily in a society that relegated them to the fridges and where they were regarded as intellectually and racially inferior to white people. African Americans who challenged this oppressive system were lynched, jailed, or forcefully repressed. Most of the African Americans who managed to rise up the social ladder were people who were ready to play second fiddle and embrace the wise world hegemonic structure for the American society. The narrator of the novel embarks on a journey in a search of visibility and success and documents his discovery along the way. Invisible Man is predicted on several layers of symbols and metaphors through which the author presents the attempts by an average African American to assert his or her right to self-determination. When it was published in 1952, it was on the American bestseller list for about 16 weeks as a result of the topicality of its message in a society grappling with racism. Invisible Man is a story of a black American in the 20th century who sought to be known, successful, and well acclaimed, but had to learn 
through diverse experiences of his invincibility as a black person in a white dominated society. At the beginning of the novel, the narrator, who remains nameless throughout the story, emphasizes his invisibility. He knows that this invisibility is as a result of people's inability to see him or take note of him. In reality, the narrator is not invincible. He admits that he has been hiding from the rest of the world by living underground. He has also been stealing electricity from Monopolated Light and Power Company. He uses 1,389 bulbs at the same time. While Louis Armstrong's What Did I Do To Be So Black and Blue is repeatedly playing on a phonograph. He intends to write the story of his life and his invincibility while staying underground. The narrator learns that in the United States of America, a person's color play a vital role in social mobility, especially mobility on the social ladder. In the American society, where the narrator lives, as a black person, he is expected to defer at all times to the whims and caprices of wives. As a young boy, he is haunted by his grandfather's deathbed admonition to overcome the white man with yeses. At different stages in the narration, the author shows how the black person is humiliated by whites who want to show that blacks are inferior to them. An example of this occurs when the narrator gets an opportunity to present a speech at the Battle Royal program for white seniors. The privilege was extended to him as a result of the address he had delivered at his senior high school graduation party. However, he is unprepared for the horrific events that he witnesses and experiences at the program. He is forced by the school superintendent, who are taking the narrator and some other black students to participate in watching a white nude girl dance. The black boys are not expected to show any sign of sexual arousal. After enduring this scene, he is blindfolded alongside some of his mates and instructed to fight. They all fight one another for no just cause. Then, they were made to pick fake gold pieces piled on an electrified rug. When they try to pick the pieces without making contact with the rug, the white men kick them and push them onto the rug so that they can laugh at their pain. Finally, they were all paid $5 for their participation in the Battle Royal contest. Tatlock is paid an extra $5 for emerging as winner during the fighting bout. After the narrator has been beaten black and blue, he is given a chance to speak. Though most of the white men were not listening to his speech, he talks about social equality. His reference to social equality, which from the perspective of the narrator is synonymous to racial equality, almost gets him leashed by the white men. But for the intervention of the school superintendent, he corrects himself repeatedly, asserting that what he means to say was social responsibility and not social equality. At the end of his speech, he is given a scholarship to a college for blacks. That night, he has a dream. In the dream, his grandfather appears to him and shows him the content of the letter he was given. To whom it may concern, keep this nigger boy running. After gaining admission into the college, the narrator distinguishes himself academically so much that he is given the privilege of driving Mr. Norton, a wealthy white trustee of the college. The trustee became interested in the cause of Jim Trueblood, a black who had impregnated his biological daughter. At a point in the narration, the narrator drives Mr. Norton to Golden Day, which serves as a beer parlor and brothel for blacks. Mr. Lawson loses consciousness during a fracas at the Golden Day, and he is resuscitated with a bottle of whiskey. At Golden Day, 
He witnesses an argument between a doctor, a military veteran who challenges Norton on the issue of race relations. The trustee is provoked and asks the narrator to drive him back to the college. On their return, the narrator apologizes first to Mr. Norton and then to Mr. Bledsoe, but his apology are discountenanced. The events that had happened at Golden Day and the narrator a firm reprimand and tongue lashing from Mr. Bedso, the president of the college. The president feels that the narrator has to have presented a worthier image of blacks to Mr. Norton. An angry Bedso deceitfully expels the narrator from the college and gives him seven letters of recommendation, all addressed to the college's trustee, who are in New York. He instructs the narrator to go to them in search of a job. The narrator travels to Harlem, but his search for a job is futile. Unknown to him, the seven letters written by Mr. Bezo depicted him as someone worthless, undignified, and irresponsible. It is as Mr. Emerson's offers, one of the men to whom the letter is addressed, that the narrator learns the exact content of the message. With the assistance of Mr. Emerson's son, the narrator is offered a menial job at the Liberty Paints plant, a paint manufacturing factory. He initially declines, but later accepts the offer. At Liberty Paints, the narrator is initiated into workplace politics that is also steeped in racism. First, he works with Mr. Kimbrough, a wise man whose refusal to explain things into details leads the narrator to relocate to basement number two, where he is made to work with a grumpy old man named Lucius Brookway. Brookway's insecurity in his workplace makes him engage in a fight with the narrator. Later, Brookway sets him up for a workplace accident. That leads to his dismissal from the factory. After the incident, while he stood at the factory hospital, he is used against his will by the white doctors as a guinea pig for electric shock treatment. This harsh treatment at the hospital makes him suffer temporary memory loss and fatigue. He leaves the hospital light-headed and almost fainted on his way home. Mary Rambo, a black American woman, rescues him and nurtures him back to life. Having lost hope of securing a job, he goes to Mary's house where he had been staying, packs his bag and returns to Mary's house where he stays for a month without a job. One day, tired and depressed, he goes on a walk and witnesses an eviction of an 87-year-old man and his wife. He, together with many other blacks, are moved by this ugly spectacle. And at some point, they started to beat up the marshal in charge of the eviction. The narrator, in a bid to restore peace, gives a speech of disposition and urges the people to help return the people's load into their apartment. Eagerly, the black foes and some whites Embrace this cleanup exercise. Some police officers hear about the incident and they label these people as rioters for standing in the way of an eviction. The narrator escapes from the scene and is trailed by Brother Jack, who allows him to work with the Brotherhood as a spokesman for the Harlem district. He initially rejected the offer, but later accepts it when he considered how indebted he is to Mary, who had been taking care of him. He is given a new identity, and he gives his first speech in Harlem, which is criticized by a number of the brothers. But Brother Jack approves his action. He is sent to Brother Hambro, so that he can learn more about the Brotherhood. After four months, he is made the head of Harlem district. Things go on well with him, until one morning, when he received an anonymous letter 
warning him to tread carefully. Later, he is set up by Brother Westrom, who accuses him of using the Brotherhood for his selfish desires. The disciplinary committee hears the case and finds him not guilty of the charges preferred against him, but demands that he remains inactive in Harlem for a while or move downtown to serve as an advocate on issues relating to women. The narrator is surprised when this happens, but he accepts the offer to move downtown while serving his punishment. He is seduced by a white woman who attends one of his meetings. For this, he tortures himself with worry as he wonders whether his brief sexual ties with a woman was a setup to embarrass him. After some weeks, he is instructed by the Brotherhood to return to Harlem as the affairs of the Brotherhood as it concerned Harlem was no longer functioning optimally. He notices that many black members, including Todd Clinton, a prominent black brother, have left the Brotherhood as a result of their disillusionment with the activities of the organization. He also realizes that the Brotherhood has lost its place of prominence in Harlem to Ras, the exhorter. He is surprised at all these changes and makes efforts to unravel the mystery behind what happened in his absence. His efforts were however futile. On one of his walks, he is stunned to see Clifton selling obscene dancing dolls named Sambu, for which he has no sales permit. He finds it hard to comprehend what could have happened to Clifton to make him resort to this despicable means of livelihood after leaving the Brotherhood. He is further confounded as to how a man can deliberately choose to leave the Brotherhood to sell dolls. The police accuse Clifton because he does not have a seal permit. An argument ensues, and while trying to escape, Clifton is shot dead by the police officer. Witnessing Clifton's death has a very traumatic effect on the narrator. After waiting endlessly for orders from the Brotherhood headquarters, the narrator decides to stage a remarkable funeral for Clifton. This funeral he does to the provocation of the Brotherhood. He is heavily criticized for giving a heroic funeral for someone who has been labeled as a criminal because he chose to renounce his membership of the Brotherhood. It is this criticism of his action that removes the skills from the narrator's eyes. He finally sees the Brotherhood movement as an embodiment of deceit, which does not strictly uphold the values that it espouses. One of the significant discoveries by the narrator is the fact that his mentor, Brother Jake, who had introduced him to the Brotherhood, is partly blind. A metaphorical reference to the fact that the Brotherhood is blind to its fault. Enraged that he, like Clifton, had only been used as a tool in the hands of the Brotherhood to be used and damned at will, he decides to take his grandfather's advice. He should tell the wives the kind of lies they want to hear. The narrator is also disappointed at the wills of the Brotherhood and he begins to map out plans on how to revenge. By this time, Harlem is witnessing increased agitation by blacks over race relations. He is confronted by Ras, who is furious at what he considered as untruthful taxes of the Brotherhood. To avoid being waylaid by Ras and his men, the narrator disguises himself by wearing a pair of dark glasses and a hat. Eventually, the narrator goes to Brother Hambro's apartment, where Hambro tells him that the Brotherhood has chosen to de-emphasize Harlem and its activities in the neighborhood. Hambro admits that the members of the Brotherhood are mere pawns within the ambush of the Brotherhood's plans. 
The narrator decides to undermine the brotherhood from within using a woman, Sibyl, who is married to one of the leaders of the group. Later, he discovers that the woman does not know anything about the inner workings of the brotherhood. Sibyl is only interested in how she could fulfill her fantasy, which revolves around being raped by a black man. During the period of his encounter with Sibyl, he receives a call from Harlem. He is asked to come there because of the riots that had broken out, which had engulfed the whole neighborhood. He joins some of the men to burn a tenement building where he and some of their astonished lives. He also encounters Rags the Exhorter, who gives directives that the narrator should be killed. Rags throws a spear at the narrator and it misses him narrowly. Before he flees from the scene, the narrator throws a spear at Rags and it goes through his cheek. The narrator flees only to encounter some men whom he had mistaken for police officers who suspect that his briefcase contains items looted during the riots. In an attempt to run from this man, the narrator falls into a utility hole and the man that he is running away from cover the hole. It becomes his abode for an indefinite period. He does not leave the place until the end of his story when he decides to emerge from the manhole. Thus, the end of the story is also the beginning of a new phase of experience for him. It is in the manhole that he comes to Tim with his invisibility as a black person in the American society. The major themes of this novel include the invisibility of blacks in the American society, racial inequality and prejudice, this unity among blacks, the search for an identity, and discrimination. Thanks for watching this video. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share this video.